The next speaker is Marsha Hagis, and Marsha received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin in 2002, and as Tyler mentioned, did her postdoctoral training at MIT uh, with Lenny Garenti. In 2006, she uh, took a position as an assistant professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School and is also a member of the Paul F. Glenn Laboratories for Biological Mechanisms of Aging. Her work has contributed to showing that the mitochondrial sirtuins regulate metabolism in aging, and she's going to tell you today about the role of these proteins in tumor cell metabolism. Marsha, it's a pleasure to have you here. So I want to thank the organizers for inviting me today. Um, I remember during my time at MIT as a postdoc in Lenny Garante's lab that this symposium really is such a highlight for the community. So thank you. Um, can you advance to the next slide, please? So my lab is interested in the central question of how does mitochondrial metabolism contribute to aging and age-related disease. And what we're interested in is in understanding how pathways of aging, such as sirtuins, contribute to changes in mitochondrial metabolism, mitochondrial signaling um, during different diseases of aging. And a large um, proportion of my lab studies diabetes and metabolic syndromes and disorders. But we've um, become growingly interested in the area of cancer metabolism because, as you hear today, there's such an overlap between um, mitochondrial metabolic networks in the area of diabetes and how cells use energy to uh, regulate the relationship between anaplerosis and um, catabolic pathways. So sirtuins are highly conserved from bacteria to humans. And in mammals, there are seven sirtuins called SIRT1 through 7. They're first identified by a conserved sirtuin core domain in yeast SIRT2. Sirtuins have, um, next, thank you. And so sirtuins have a highly uh, conserved core domain um, that contains their catalytic activity, and they have a divergent flanking sequences that likely help to dictate their substrate specificity as well as different subcellular localizations. Sirtuins have a really interesting enzymatic activity. They function as NAD-dependent deacetylases or ADP ribosyl transferases. Their absolute reliance on NAD um, makes them a really interesting metabolic sensor. So their activity is coupled to the metabolic state of the cell. Three sirtuins are localized in the mitochondria, SIRT3, 4, and 5. And this localization is particularly intriguing to us because recent proteomic analyses of um, lysine acetylation has shown surprisingly that approximately 15% of mitochondrial proteins can be modified by acetylation, suggesting that their deacetylation and um, the levels of this modification can be modified by mitochondrial sirtuins. Moreover, um, the substrates or the proteins that are acetylated are themselves in central players of mitochondrial metabolism and um, could potentially be regulators of how mitochondrials use fuel. So for instance, components of fat oxidation are heavily acetylated. Um, components of the TCA cycle, electron transport chain subunits, as well as amino acid and um, metabolic enzymes are also acetylated. And intriguingly, although mitochondrial sirtuins in comparison to uh, SIRT1, which is the mammalian ortholog of SIRT2, which is the most heavily studied sirtuin, um, mitochondrial sirtuins are not as well studied. Um, but the few studies that have come out recently have shown that there is a really elegant coordination of how sirtuins are working together in the mitochondria to regulate how cells use fuels. So for instance, um, both SIRT4 and SIRT3 bind to an enzyme called glutamate dehydrogenase. When I was a postdoc in Lenny Garante's lab, we showed that SIRT4 binds to GDH and represses its enzymatic activity. 
SIRT3 also stimulates um, fatty acid oxidation during times of nutrient deprivation to promote um, fat oxidation in the mitochondria. SIRT3 also binds to multiple subunits of the electron transport chain, including subunits in complexes 1, um, complex 2, and SDH, as well as complex 3. Um, and so there is a coordination of mitochondrial metabolism by sirtuins. How individual sirtuins work together to um, maintain uh, energy homeostasis in cells under different energy conditions, under different stress conditions, is still not well understood. Among the mitochondrial sirtuins, SIRT3 is the most studied sirtuin. And so shown here is a list of its target um, proteins, often interacting proteins that are themselves acetylated, and the pathways that are regulated. And so for instance, SIRT3 binds to LCAT and deacetylates it, stimulating fatty acid oxidation. So the net effect of SIRT3 activation is in stimulation of mitochondrial oxidative metabolism. Um, I also want to point out that SIRT3 has a newly emerging role in the main maintenance of redox balance and ROS clearance in the cell. So it's very interesting that in addition to making the electron transport chain more efficient, SIRT3 also helps to promote the clearance of free radicals um, by, for instance, deacetylating SOD2. And so because of its wide... Um, variety of mitochondrial substrates, we became very interested in a general question of how does SIRT3 function or loss of function impact general cellular uh, metabolism. And so this is a project really driven by a talented graduate student in the lab, Lydia Finley. And she undertook a metabolomic approach in collaboration with Clary Cleish here at the Broad Institute. And what we did was we harvested metabolites from wild type or knockout um, littermate MEFs, and we analyzed polar metabolites by LCMS. And what we found um, was a complete metabolic shift in the redistribution or the ratios of, of glycolytic metabolites and TCA cycle metabolites. So um, metabolites of glycolysis that were measurable were increased in sort of three knockout cells while metabolites, many metabolites in the TCA cycle were decreased. And for instance, if you look at the data, intracellular glucose levels were decreased. Um, moreover, um, a metabolite in the pentose phosphate pathway was increased when, with loss of SIRT3. Now, these are snapshots, and so to dynamically measure changes of fuel utilization by loss of SIRT3, we measured glucose uptake and found that, indeed, there was a dramatic increase in glucose uptake and usage by the cells, um, and also an increase in lactic acid secretion. And this effect is often referred to as the Warburg effect, as Matt nicely introduced earlier today. And so I don't have to go into the details, but in a quiescent state, much of the, most of the metabolized glucose and pyruvate is utilized by mitochondria to maintain energy in the cell, whereas during a rapidly proliferating state, such as a tumor cell, um, glucose is the, the pyruvate from glucose is a metabolized to lactate. Furthermore, um, glucose is glucose metabolites are also used for other pathways for building biomass, such as the pentose phosphate pathway. So about this time we were generating this data, an interesting paper came out from David Geis's lab um, demonstrating that SIRT3 is a tumor suppressor. So SIRT3 knockout mice are completely viable. They look identical to litter mate controls. They have normal development. And there's no uh, apparent detectable phenotype unless you start to probe individual processes under the exactly right condition. Um, but with age, so about at 12 to 18 months, 50% of SIRT3 knockout mice spontaneously develop mammary tumors. And the mechanism um, that was uh, responsible for this involved ROS, cellular reactive oxygen species, that increased in SIRT3 knockout cells, 
promoting genomic instability and tumorigenesis. We had a different idea for this. We had a different question. We wanted to know, because CERT3 functions primarily in the mitochondria to bind and regulate so many metabolic enzymes, um, and because we discovered that CERT3 results or controls this global, global cellular reprogramming from mitochondrial metabolism to glycolytic metabolism, could CERT3 also contribute to tumorigenesis via metabolic reprogramming. And of course, this could give many different advantages to tumor cells, including rapid ATP generation, survival during or under hypoxic conditions, as well as this biosynthetic growth advantage. And so we first tested this idea by simply measuring their proliferation rate of CERT3 wild type or knockout MAFs under high glucose conditions. And we saw that indeed, loss of CERT3 um, results in cells that grow faster, that divide faster. And this is entirely dependent on glucose. So when we take those same cells and measure their proliferation in media containing no glucose, now containing gal galactose, we can see that they have an identical growth rate. Moreover, this is true in vivo. So we've done FDG PET imaging of glucose uptake. Um, and we can see that CERT3 knockout mice in the brown adipose tissue uptake more glucose than control animals. And when we um, analyzed the pathways involved, we were quite surprised. So we performed microarray analysis of wild type compared to litter mate knockout um, brown adipose tissue. Because CERT3 is a mitochondrial metabolic enzyme, we thought that um, we kind of expected a number of mitochondrial pathways to jump out, maybe compensating, um, perhaps involved in mitobiogenesis, et cetera. But instead, what we found was that CERT3 loss upregulated a number of tumorigenic pathways, such as RAS signatures, um, MIG signatures, as well as hypoxic signatures that were dramatically upregulated during CERT3 loss. And this really piqued our attention. So we analyzed how does hypoxia affect, um, how does CERT3 affect the hypoxic response? And so during normoxia, we can see that CERT3 knockout cells start out with higher levels of glycolytic intermediates. During hypoxia, wild type cells increase the levels of glycolytic glycolytic intermediates, and this response is even um, more dramatically upregulated in CERT3 knockout cells. And so what's the mechanism involved? And so we became very interested in a master regulator of hypoxia called HIF1-alpha. And during hypoxia, HIF1-alpha is stabilized um, and forms a, a dimer with HIF beta. And that um, translocates to the nucleus to drive the expression of genes that allow cells to adapt to low oxygen conditions. So for instance, um, HIF1-alpha HIF activity drives the expression of GLUT1 and H-hexokinase 2 to increase glycolytic metabolism. Now, during normoxic conditions, HIF is greatly destabilized, HIF-1-alpha is greatly destabilized, because during normoxia, um, PhDs are activated, and they hydroxylate residues on HIF-1-alpha that render it a very good substrate for VHL activity. And VHL is a ubiquitin ligase that then um, targets HIF-1-alpha for, deg for proteolytic degradation. And so HIF-1-alpha activity really by driving changes in gene expression, helps cells decide whether or not to use um, oxidative phosphorylation or glycolytic metabolism, um, thereby helping the cell deal with low oxygen conditions and kind of deal with um, maintaining ROS or, or detriments of low oxygen. And so because HIF-1-alpha maintains this shift, we wanted to know, could CERT3 regulate HIF1-alpha, thereby maintaining um, the balance between glycolytic metabolism and oxidative phosphorylation? <laughs> 